last week we began, we, uh, we finished by talking about Satan. We, began, we finished uh, by talking about the devil. Does anyone remember what the name Satan means? Accuser, accuser. And the word devil, of course, means enemy. That means enemy. And uh, though he is out to destroy, he is out to, to uh, bring down every good thing that God can possibly do, all of those kind of things. We looked at uh, what Peter said about him, and Peter called the devil a what? Did you catch that? What did he call the devil? He called the devil a roaring lion, remember? And uh, one sneaking around, just uh, waiting to jump on people, pounce on them, and pull them down. Over against that, the Apostle Paul talked about the devil and all the hosts of the devil and how we need to have armor and weapons in order to fight him because we are in a life and death kind of battle. So he had those two different pictures. What we want to look at real briefly now today is how he also assaulted Jesus. And this is found in Matthew chapter 4. And so if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 4 in your Bible, it's on page 809. 809. And there we see the temptation of Jesus. We'll read through this just very briefly and, and um, see the devil trying to pull him down. What he does, what the devil tries to do in this is bring about what he did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He led them away from the Lord and into sin, and we saw that on the board last week. But here again now, he tries to do that with Jesus himself. So chapter 4 Verse 1, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now, as you look at all of that, what you see is the same strategy that he used with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. First of all, he tries to pull them away from pull Christ himself, away from God's own word. And he tries to get him to use his power for himself, make bread, make stones into bread. And that, of course, uh, is drawing him away from God's promise to take care of him. And Jesus answers them and says, Man shall not live by bread alone. And then he takes him up to this place, uh, this pentacle, and says, jump off and you'll gain a lot of reputation and be spectacular and people will come to you in droves and uh, you'll be able to gather a, uh, 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 gather a group of people or a following immediately. And he lies to Jesus and says, you know, the, the angels are going to come and protect you and, and uh and uh, rescue you if you do that. So you don't have to be, have any fear. You can jump off and, and all that's going to happen. It's all a big lie. And then he goes, and then he uh, takes him to a place and says, you know, I'll give you the whole world if you'll bow down and worship me. Well, again, it was a lie. So what you see him doing here with Jesus is the same thing that you saw him doing with Adam and Eve. First, he draws, tries to draw him away from God's very plain word. Then he contradicts what God says, and then he makes his own promises, you see. Same thing all over again. Jesus, though, counteracts what he says by using God's word to thwart him or by reminding him of God's word and saying, I'm going to stay with God's word. And that's what the Apostle Paul in that passage in Ephesians does too. He says, our weapon is the word of God. That's the sword that we have to uh, withstand his temptations. Well, all of that is, is, is the work of the devil, the work of Satan himself. Now, I want you to look then at another place in the scripture where Jesus assesses the devil and uh, speaks as to what he sees him as and it comes out very plainly in what I've just said. But look at John 8:43. John 
43. Let me see where that is. That is on page John 8, 43. It's on page 895, 895, John 8, 43. This is Jesus now, his assessment of the devil. Got it? 895. Why do you not... I lost my place. Here it is. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's will. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is very straightforward there. What does he call the devil? Two things. Calls him a liar and calls him a murderer. Murderer, of course. For, who were the first people he murdered? Adam and Eve left them away from life and into death, murdered them, brought death into their lives. And of course, he lied to them too. So he is a liar and a murderer. Jesus sees him as that. And we saw that last week once again, you know, the strategy, the strategy of temptation. He pulls us away from God's word. He contradicts God's word. He makes his own promises. And then come the consequences. And the consequences, of course, are so many and so manifold. And we'll talk about those uh, in just a minute. But since he is the tempter and since he is constantly after us, attacking and assaulting. Does the Bible free us from responsibility? Does the Bible free us from responsibility for our sin? And the scriptures say what? No, of course not, that we are still responsible. But knowing this, knowing this, why do we give in to him? You know, he comes with temptation and knowing that he's a liar, knowing that he's a murderer, knowing that he's up to no good, that his promises are not going to be so, and that he's going to do everything he can to pull us down and make a mess out of our lives, why do we give in to him? Why do we succumb? Look at James chapter 1, verse 12. By the way, this is the epistle lesson that was read this morning in church. We read these verses this morning, but look at James chapter 1, verse 12. That is on page 1011. 1011. Got it? 1011. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say that he is tempted. I am being tempted by God when he is tempted. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do you see what it says? That we are lured and deceived by our own desire. Huh? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. <coughs> that there is in us there is in us that which would go toward the wrong rather than the right. That would go toward the bad rather than the good. That the devil simply comes along and knocks on our door and says, here's an opportunity, and we will believe him and give in to him. You see? And then look what he says. There's this desire in us. And when that desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Sin in the beginning looks good. Looks like fun, 
But when it has run its course, it ruins, it kills, and it destroys. Always takes us farther than we intended to go with it, you see. It takes us to ends that we did not imagine that it could take us to. But somehow we would think that we can say, we can draw the line at the right time, that type of thing. So temptation happens because we're already geared in that direction. And Satan simply comes along and rings the doorbell and says, here is opportunity. So temptation comes. And it never ceases. He's after us all of our lives. Think of this. He comes to us in youth. He comes to us in youth. There are different temptations at different times of life. But youth, when he, think of how he tempts us as young people. It's different in middle age, different in old age or older age and so on. But what are some of the temptations that youth fa face? You know, think of it today. Think of the temptations you faced as a youth. Hmm? What are some of the temptations? Certainly alcohol. Yes. Or, of course, other drugs too. Alcohol is simply one drug, doesn't it? There's all kinds of drugs. Huh? Temptation, yes. Alcohol, drugs. What else? Hmm? Abortion, yes, if you, yes. Yes. Of course, before the abortion, we, he is tempting us already to sex outside of marriage, isn't he? Huh? Yeah, he's tempting us to sex outside of marriage, and uh, which then may lead, of course, to pregnancy, which would then could be followed by the temptation to abortion. Yeah, so that would all go together, could all go together, of course. Doesn't have to, this doesn't have to be, but this, of course, also is a temptation because he has certainly put parameters. Sex is a gift to God, which we'll talk about when we come to the Sixth Commandment, but he also puts parameters around it because it can do such damage to us too. Yes. What else? I think one is in our society today is impatience. And by that I mean we want everything right now. Instant self-gratification. I can't wait or work for anything. I have to have it right now. And so there's a certain impatience, you see, which sometimes parents give in to, which is, of course, detrimental to the child when that happens. What else might come in here? The idea we got plenty of time, you know, the plenty of time um, that we can, I was talking to a senior in high school a while back and he said, I said, what are you going to do next year? And he says, nothing, I'm just going to kind of bum around and, and so on, just to take a year off, take a year off from life. And uh, uh, boy, you can do that, I guess, when you're 18, you think you've got forever to live. And of course, life is very short and goes by very fast. And uh, just wasting a whole year doing nothing is really not a good idea. But that might be the temptation of youth, you know. Oh, there's just so much still um, that I can, I can waste that, huh? Youth alcohol. Um, not to use the abilities that God has given. We run into that in school, don't we? That God has given us a good mind and, and, and we waste that grand opportunity that God gives to us. Huh? Yes. Hmm? Disobedience. Disobedience, yes, sure. Over against our parents, yes, that uh, we aren't willing to listen to their experience, we're not listen to their wisdom and their guidance and all of those things, yeah. But the point I'm making is that the temptations will come to youth, and those are different than come to us, let's say, in middle age. Middle age. Am I doing something wrong? Okay. Middle age. What would be some of the temptations that would come to us in middle age? Now, let's say we are married and, and 
in our 30s, whatever it might be, whatever middle age is, and on beyond that? What might be the temptations that would come at this point? Adultery. Huh? Adultery. Adultery, most certainly. We can begin, we're unhappy about this or that other thing, and, and so we are uh, vulnerable in that area, and the devil can come and tempt us and pull us away from the Lord in that way. What else? Just ambition in this sense that we're going to make up for perhaps what we didn't um, gain back here. If we wasted our, if we wasted time in our youth and we just uh, let opportunity go by without taking advantage of it, then suddenly we get to middle age and we do realize that we've wasted time and now we are intent upon making that up and we've become very ambitious and we're going to do this and do that and we'll cut corners and do things financially we should not do, of course, which are contrary to God's word. And we're trying to make up for the sin of that era and now we're caught in this era too. Middle age. What other sins might be there? You know, if life is going really well and I am experiencing God's blessings in terms of prosperity and a good job and all that kind of stuff, I can become very indifferent to the Lord. Huh? And I just have no need for the Lord. And I'm very self satisfied and very uh, self centered and so on and so forth. Couldn't be better. And we live as though that's going to go on forever. You see, yes. Also, this back here, too, in youth, you know, both youth and middle age, all the way through life, we are growing spiritually and we are building the strengths we're going to need to meet the problems of life at whatever, problem, at whatever point in life they come. But if we are neglecting God's word and we are indifferent to that because life is going good, my, uh, it can really be detrimental down the line, you know. Sometimes uh, we drift away from the Lord in these years, too, in, in, in the younger years. And we drift away when things are going very well, very good. And I have parents say to me, you know, I don't know what's happened to my youth. I brought them up in Sunday school and I brought them up in the church and so on. And now they don't want anything to do with it. And I say, the problem is life has been very good for them. They don't know. They don't realize uh, all those kind of things. They simply do not realize what uh, might be, they're not preparing for it, they don't realize what good that they have experienced. Yeah. Um, listening to a, uh, um, a lecture yesterday, this could be middle age too. Um, poor parenting. Poor parenting. My goodness. If we get to middle age, and, uh, or even before that, Poor parenting. What's poor parenting? Not the All right. Do not teach your pass on to your children the, the yes, the word. To, you don't pass on to your children um, God's word. You don't pass on to them the Christian life. You don't pass on to them responsibility and so on and so forth. One of the things they were bringing out here was connected with impatience and self gratification. That uh, so many parents today are very self indulgent and in the sense that they. Uh, give their children way too much and too much too soon and all of those kind of things and uh, no longer require them to work for these things and, and, uh, and uh, just uh, make them into people uh, who have received too much too soon and all those kind of things. And as a result of that, uh, they don't uh, require their children that which they should require, which uh, finally comes uh, produces low self-esteem and all of those kind of things and, and a kind of a dependence upon others. But that certainly can come in here too. If life is going very good for us and, and everything seems to be coming together and we simply uh, do not uh, require of our children those things which we perhaps should. Or older life. I don't know what old age is, but... But... Uh, the temptations when we get older... Maybe worry because of we don't want to be dependent. Uh, we're fearful of what might be in the future. Uh, uncertainty might come about how life is going to end or how we're going to take care of ourselves and all those kind of things. And so we begin to worry and we can become quite anxious because of that, you see. 
all of those things worry. Another one would be what? Huh? Envy. Envy certainly can come in. Uh, we envy youth and the things connected with youth. Uh, uh, envy can come in. As a widower, I know what that means in terms of, uh, you know, this, uh, this man has his wife and they are still a couple and I can envy them. How can he have his wife and my wife is gone and he has that blessing and I don't have that blessing. I've talked to enough widows and widowers to know that envy becomes a problem on those kind of things and, and that because of that, you see. But also uh, uh, just self-righteousness can creep in there too. If we've lived a pretty good life, we can become self-righteous over against those who have not, you see. That we look back with pride instead of with humility, that kind of thing. Now, youth, what I'm trying to get across here is that we are embattled people. We are embattled people. And the devil is after us from the very begin to the very end of life. He never quits. He never, never quits. And uh, he is attacking us. He is assaulting us. And he's trying to pull us away from the Lord, pull us down, and uh, destroy us spiritually. He never, never quits. Now, you've heard this, and we've been talking about this, uh, and you've heard this word used several times, the word sin. And we want to look at that word and see what we mean by that. Because the Bible talks about sin. My that happens when I move over here, doesn't it? Probably I should pull this over and not move over to that side. Okay. The Bible talks about sin in two different ways. There is sin with capital letters. And there is sin with small letters. Okay. And uh, sin with capital letters, of course, is a disease of our being. This is how it is talked about. A disease of our being. And sin with small letters is a disease of our doing. The Bible points to the fact that we are born into this world with sin. We are born into this world corrupted. We are born into this world anti-God. We are born into this world anti-authority. We are born into this world without any fear or love for God. We, want, we, we're, we will permit him to stay in his universe, but we want him to stay away from us. We don't want him in any way interfering in our lives, telling us what to do or not to do. We want to be in control ourselves. And so we're born into this world anti-God. Fear, no fear of God, no love for God. We are born into the world. Remember those spiritual conditions I talked about in the very first letter, lesson? I said we are born into this world blind, what? Dead, Dead and, and an enemy of God. That's not a, that's not a pretty picture. But that's how we are born into this world. That's a pretty desperate picture, isn't it? When you stop and think about it. You were born into this world. All right. Jesus talked about it in this way. He says that out of the heart comes murder, theft, false witness, adultery, so on and so forth. What he's saying is all of that comes from the inside. And Satan simply comes along and tempts us and gives us opportunity for that to come out. But it's already in there. It's already in there. And it will come out. When children are born, of course, they're very cute and look very innocent and very pure and so on. But it doesn't take long for that to begin to come out. I don't have to teach a child to be selfish. I don't have to teach a child to manipulate me and do all kinds of things in order to get its own way. That's already there. And that's what is meant by a disease of being. I'm brought into this world. I'm, I pass on parents pass on to their children their sin and that comes all the way down from Adam and Eve in the Old Testament yes now what that does then is it contributes to the sin of our doing I sin because I am a sinner I don't become a sinner because I sin but I sin because I am born a sinner it's already in there and so it comes out in all kinds of ways here the disease of our being. Jesus says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. In other words, I'm a slave of sin. I, I, that's just the way I go. 
The Apostle Paul talked about this. He said, that which I want to do so often I don't do, and that which I don't want to do I so often do. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the Apostle Paul looking at himself and says, O wretched man that I am. So often I don't do what I know I should do, and so often I don't do what I know I should do. And that's the greatest apostle you see of them all, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, one of the greatest disciples of Jesus that ever lived, huh? Yeah. And that's the Apostle Paul looking at himself and saying, my, cell, my, my, death, my situation is desperate, and if it weren't for my Lord Jesus, why? What? How terrible it would be. So, sin then over here is a disease of our being. You know, if this were all that sin were, then I would have the hope maybe of reaching that point where I would not sin. But it cannot be because of that over there. You know, there's been some very moral men in the world who have tried, of course, to uh, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, so to speak, and overcome their liabilities or their sin. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of those. You know, he came up with a list of 16 different virtues. He said, if a person could attain these virtues, he would be perfect, you see. And my, if you could just attain all of these. And those virtues were something like honesty, of course, and integrity and truthfulness and so on. And uh, he talked about patience, patience, you know, talked about that and how he worked so hard to be patient. And for two weeks he worked on that and really struggled to be patient in every kind of circumstance. And after so many days and a couple of weeks or so, he thinks he's got this virtue patience under control and kind of got that worked out. And now he can move on to the next virtue. And he moves on to the next virtue then, which is total honesty. And pretty soon he finds himself being impatient again. And there's no way he comes to the conclusion that he's going to be able to attain those virtues by himself, you see. So what he's showing, of course, is because of that over there, this over here is so, and this over here is not going to be overcome because of that over there. Now, there are... Two different kinds of this sin here, and those two different kinds are called commission and omission. Commission and omission. Commission is, of course, doing that which I know I should not do. Omission is not doing that which I know I should do. So often when we think of sin, though, we think of just this. Commission, you see, not doing, I mean, doing what I should not do. And we don't think of sin in terms of omission. And yet, both are there. And both are in the commandments, of course, and all through the scriptures. And it's interesting, too, that in the picture of Jesus and judgment, when on the last day, folks come before him, and he separates the sheep from the goats. Do you remember that story? The sheep from the goats. He separates the sheep from the goats. And he says, over here are the goats and here over here are the sheep. It's a picture of judgment. And how does he know? What does he judge on? He says, you didn't feed the hungry. You didn't clothe the naked. You didn't give medicine to the sick. You didn't visit those in prison. You didn't go to those who needed help. And it's all on omission. You see, all the judgment is over against omission. He doesn't say, you did this, and you did this, and you did this. He simply said, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, and you didn't do this. Pointing out the fact that, of course, to neglect, neglect your brother in need is that which is contrary to God's will. He knows his own, by the way, because those are the very things he did here in this world in his ministry. But the sins of omission over against the sins of commission. When we go out Kennedy calling, and we call on people, and we talk about sin, uh, people... There are people who think that they do not sin, but they think only in terms of this here, and then only the big things. You know, I, well, I've never committed adultery, I've never stolen, I've never murdered anyone, I've never beat up my wife, and they feel all these things that you might do, and they know that they should not do, and they don't do them. But then if you talk about, then you say, of course, uh, do you go to church? Do you worship the Lord? Well, no. Uh, what did you do in terms of uh, feeding the hungry last year? Well, really nothing. And so you begin to look at this, and it's quite a different story. But they're very self-righteous, and they believe they're going to get into heaven because they haven't done these big, terrible things, the sins of 
commission, over against the sins of omission. Those two things. So when we think of sin here, then we think of those things that I've just mentioned there. Now, here at this point, we would differ with the Roman Catholic Church, which talks about sins of venial sins and mortal sins. Venial sins are sins which are wrong, but they're kind of like misdemeanors. They're not all that bad, and they won't send you to hell. Whereas mortal sin is really bad sin, and that will send you to hell. And they've even defined these in terms of, well, in, in various kind of terms. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether they've changed this in terms of uh, inflation or not, but I know at one time if you stole more than $50, that was a mortal sin, but if you stole less than $50, that was a venial sin. And, and things like that, they uh, kind of work that all out, you see. And, uh, of course, moral sin is sin that will send you to hell. So you really got to watch out for that. By the way, it's mortal sin if you do not go to the priest once a year, at least once a year, and make confession, verbal confession. That's a mortal sin. If you don't go to the priest once a year, that's going to send you to hell. No way around that. But venial sin, mortal sin. That's not scriptural because in scripture, sin is sin. Sin is sin. Why is sin? Why is that so? Because all sin, whether it's big or little, ruptures relationship. Big or little, it separates us from God, you see. And so the principle we would think of this, it would be this. What does it take to rupture a balloon? You can rupture a balloon with an axe. It's pretty big. Or you can rupture a balloon with a pin, huh? something very small. But the point is that you have ruptured the balloon. And that's true here, too. And it talks about the Bible, and James talks about, if we sin even in one point, break the law even in one point, we are guilty of all. So, all of that being so, you see, that uh, the Bible does not classify sin. Sin is sin. That's in the eyes of God. Now, no, of course not in the eyes of society. But in the eyes of God, then telling a little lie is as bad as rape. Or, you know, uh, cheating on something is as bad as uh, murder. That's in the eyes of God. Sin is sin. Now, not, of course, in society. Society, you know, in keeping order must uh, classify, and it does, and we have a court system and all those kind of things. But in the eyes of God. So every man stands over against God as sinner. Every man stands over against God, <sighs> condemned because of his sin. Now, let's look at original sin, where this comes out. Look at, for instance, John chapter 3, verse 6. John chapter 3, verse 6. This is the exchange between Jesus and Nicodemus. And this is very significant because what it is about is original sin. And sometimes we don't realize that, that this is about original sin. But look at chapter 3, John chapter 3. This is the great chapter in which the words at the end are, for God so loved the world. But listen now. Now there was a man of the Pharisees. Oh, you got it? 887. 887. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that, whatever, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then come these most famous words, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only, that he gave, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now what gave rise to this discussion and this exchange? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. The Pharisee was a religious group at that time, and one of the tenets of the Pharisees was this. We are born into this world without sin. We are born innocent and pure. And if we keep the law, and they were very precise in this, they took the Ten Commandments and everything in the Old Testament, New, uh, in the Old Testament and divided it down, and they came up with 613 different laws. And they said, if you can keep these 613 different laws, both some of them positive, some of them negative, you'll get yourself into heaven. So what they were saying was this, your first birth will get you into heaven if you live the right kind of life afterwards, if you keep all the laws of the scripture. Your first birth will get you into heaven if you keep all the laws of scripture. That was their teaching. And Jesus comes along and he says, no, you gotta be born again. So why this language, you have to be born again? Because he's saying to Nicodemus, your first birth won't get you into heaven. You need to be born again. Why? Because that which you're born is flesh is flesh. In other words, when you are born of sinful parents, you are born with sin and you have to deal with that. And there's only one way of dealing with that and that is through the spirit and the water, baptism. Baptism becomes then the, the born again experience an experience in which God comes into our lives and takes care of our sin problem for us. So born again, what he's talking to him about is this very thing of original sin. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Talking about new birth over against the first birth. That's where that language comes from. You hear a lot of, in, in a lot of churches about being born again, and you say you have to be born again, but yet those very churches, some of those very churches which talk about being born again, do not believe in original sin, and it just doesn't come together. It doesn't enough fit, you see, because Jesus wouldn't be talking about born again and using that language if it were not for the fact that our first birth will not get us into heaven, and if it were not for the fact that flesh begets flesh, which means sinful parents begin sinful, beget sinful parents, or sinful children. But look at another place too, uh, Romans 6.23, this also uh, speaks to this whole issue of original sin, Romans 6.23, and uh, that's a familiar passage, perhaps you've heard that before, 6.23, that's on page 943, 943. Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. Got it? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the reason for death is sin. The reason for death is sin. Babies die, sad to say, because there's already the consequences of sin there. Now God has given us all kinds of things to deal with that, but that also points to original sin. In Ephesians 2.3, look at Ephesians 2.3, that also uh, speaks to it. Ephesians 2.3, and that's on page Eight or 976, 976, Ephesians 2, 3, 976. Look at verse 1, in fact, let's we'll start there. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. He's talking to Christians, and yet you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of, this, of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and flesh, or carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
and he's talking to Christians, and he's saying, you know, we were at one time, what? Children by nature, children of wrath. By nature, we are children of wrath. Do you ever think of that? That we are born into this world under God's judgment. That's, again, pretty heavy, heavy indictment. Boy, again, pointing to the desperation of our situation, that we are born into this world under God's judgment. That's what he says, huh? Among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. That goes along with what James said. The body and the mind, and were by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, that's where we're, that's where we're born into this world dead. That's where that comes from dead in our trespasses, made us alive. It is he who gives us spiritual life together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's not your doing, it's God's grace. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, what a picture that is. It's a picture of our desperate situation, but it's also a picture of God's great grace that he reaches down into our lives to make us alive in Jesus Christ that he is the one who takes care of our sin problem, huh? Well, look at Romans 5, chapter 12, or chapter 5, verse 12. Chapter 5, go back to Romans chapter 5. Now you may think I'm belaboring a point of sin here, and I am. But we have to realize the desperation, our desperation, we have to realize our own condition before Jesus Christ will mean anything. You see, the reason Christ doesn't mean to people what he should mean is because they don't see how desperate our situation is. The greatness of Christ is seen in that I need a Savior. You see, it is this that is behind the story of Christmas. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Why do we need a Savior? Because there's absolutely nothing we can do in our sinful situation to make ourselves right with God, or to pull ourselves back up to Him spiritually. And so because our situation is so desperate, God in His love saw that, knew that it was impossible for us to do anything about it ourselves. And so He sends a Savior. And that Savior, of course, is Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 5 now, verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12. Got it? 942, 942. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. In other words, sin came into the world by one man. And even though men after that did not know the Ten Commandments, they were not given yet, still they bore the consequences of sin. Still they died. Sin was still doing its dirty work, even though people did not realize why this was happening. It was still happening. But then, verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespass, trans, trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to clean up the mess that Adam brought into the world by his own sin. So looking at all of this then, when it comes to sin, what's our situation? How much do we need 
How much help do we need to deal with this predicament that we are in? Hmm. We can deny sin and declare ourselves healthy. That we do not need any help. That I can make myself righteous before God. But somehow by my own living, by my own doing, I can, I can clean this up myself. That's one approach. I'm really healthy enough to do this. I've got enough, self, I've got enough willpower that I can do it myself. That's one way, and that's one way people do, huh? Because we run into that as we go out calling. Are you going to heaven? Sure. Why? How do you know that? Well, because I did this or I did that. And usually they, the people who think they're going to go to heaven by their own doing can usually recount to you the things that they think are going to get them in, into heaven. You know, I've heard all kinds of things. Well, I've never done this, I've never done that, and so on and so forth. But also, during the Depression, we took in my sister's family and we took care of them. And this one time I, brought some, I bought some gas for a guy who needed gas. And sometimes there were people who needed some help with them groceries and I helped them. And I've heard people give me this list of things that they have done. And these are the things that are going to get them into heaven, you see. So if you are healthy, maybe fall once in a while, you can kind of balance this out if you put enough, several good things over against this. And you can get yourself into heaven. That's one way. Hmm? There are those who think of themselves healthy and yet sick at the same time. But uh, if they do enough good, and they're always looking at that, if they have done enough good, then they can get themselves into heaven by their own good. The only trouble with that is you're always fearful of what? That you have not had enough. You've not had enough. And I've run into some sad experiences with that too. And some very sincere, devout, devout and religious people. I remember one time being at a conference or being at a seminar up at uh, Missouri Western on end of life and terminal disease and facing death and all those kind of things. And it was a, a conference and seminar just for medical people and clergy. And we listened to several lectures and then it came late or in the afternoon where we sat around a table. And uh, the question that we were to ask, that we were asked and to write about is, how would you feel and what would you think and so on and so forth if you were told that you had six months to live? You have a terminal disease and six months to live. And so we had to write down our answers to that, you see. And there was a nun there whom we later found out she, had, she was like 75 years old and she had spent her whole life in the, in, in the convent teaching children and doing all kinds of wonderful good for people. And when it came to her answer, she said, I would be afraid. Why would you be afraid? Because I don't know whether I've done enough yet to get into heaven, you see. Now here's a very devout religious person who has given her life to the service of the Lord. And yet she's saving herself by what? Goodness. By her own goodness, by her own goodness. So once you would save yourself by your own goodness, there's no way. And when you hear people say this, you hear people say this, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? Well, I hope so. I hope so. What are they depending upon? Not Jesus Christ. They're depending upon themselves and their own goodness. Yes? What if it's not good, have they done enough, but what if they say, I'm a good person? Well, then you investigate that, and of course, they're, they're the ones who come up with these good things that they have done, and they think that those will somehow outweigh their sin. They also have a very shallow view of what sin is. Usually it's these, like I said, it's big, big things. I've never done this terrible thing, this terrible thing, or this terrible thing, you know. I've never done those kind of things. And there's all kinds of people like that, you see. People who have even done some pretty bad things still will compare themselves to people who have done even worse things. Huh? Yeah. So here's a person who's done all kinds of bad things. And I run into this in jail, talking to people in jail. Well, at least I've never abused a child. Never, I've ne at least I've never sexually abused a child. And I've done these things and these things, but somehow I stand over against these, and I'm okay. Okay. 
and somehow God is going to judge me on comparison, you see, which just is not true. It's not scriptural, of course, not biblical. But even the worst, you see, will come with that kind of thought, that kind of thought. Well, the scriptures, of course, point to the results of sin. They're the results of, that are in our bodies. There's sickness, pain, all of these things. The Bible looks at these, at sin as that which brought all of that into the world. That, that uh, sickness, which leads to death eventually, um, is because of sin. And we work hard to overcome it. But I remember Dr. Tran, after we talked about this, uh, we had a doctor man, a doctor, Dr. Tran, uh, who came through this class. Um, and he came up afterwards and he said, you know, I, I believe that, I know that. He said, and the fact that there's sin, it, there's, there's always more sickness. He said, we work so hard to overcome and we do research and we get this under control and we get the vaccine and so on and so forth. But then there's something coming behind it and now there's something else. He said, there's just no end of what comes, you see. So we think that we're going to, and so we hear this, you know, we so spend so much on research and so on. And we hear this so often today, if we could just get something to take care of cancer, boy, that would kind of clear up everything. And we'd all live to be a couple hundred years old or whatever, you know, type of thing. If we could just get a hold of this thing called cancer, then that will be the, the ideal that will, you know. And yet, what do we know? If we do get a vaccine and so on that would take care of cancer, something else is going to follow it, isn't it? Because that's sin in the world, and sickness comes as a consequence. Yeah. Well, all kinds of things. So there's physical things, but there's also sin affects the mind in so many ways. Goodness. Think of this, that worry is in proportion to the amount of trust we have in ourselves. Worry is sin, and it does all kinds of bad stuff in our bodies, too, because we can't put tomorrow into the hands of God. We simply cannot trust Him or put our dependence upon Him. And guilt, of course, too. Guilt, you know, can do all kinds of things to our bodies, physically, to our bodies, you know. And sometimes it's real guilt, and sometimes it is assumed guilt. In other words, we feel guilty about something uh, that we have no control over and really uh, is not worthy of guilt, I guess you would say it that way. And I remember one of our dear saints here, a lady who had all kinds of stomach problems and, and, uh, she, and she was probably in her 60s or close to 70 uh, um, and she was a maiden lady and she had all these stomach problems. And golly, she'd go into the hospital and the doctors would take all these kind of tests and they couldn't find out what in the world is wrong because there's nothing physically wrong. And one day I was talking to her and she was in the hospital again going through all of these tests. And finally she said to me and confessed to me, she says, you know, I feel so guilty. What about, I promised my sister years ago that when we got old, I would never put her in a nursing home. I would take care of her until she died. I promised her that. But now I've had to put her in the nursing home because I can't take care of her and I just am not able. But that was eating her up, eating her up. The guilt of that was eating her up and causing all these physical problems. Well, that's an assumed guilt. And yet that also comes as a result of sin, doesn't it, you see? So guilt can cause all kinds of problems. And then mental problems, golly. And then the relationship problems, all of these things are simply the consequences of sin, aren't they? Every day we read about it on the front page of the paper. Hatred and strife and warfare and, and all of these kind of things. Sin, sin destroys everything because it destroys our relation to our Father in heaven. Golly, we have a terrible thing like this in the school in Florida last week again, you know. We blame that on guns and say what we need is more gun control. And of course, that may have something to do with it. But then there was an 80-some-year-old man who wrote a letter to the editor of the Kansas City paper. And man, that made sense to me. Because that was the same thing it was at home. 
when I was in school as a kid in rural Nebraska, the farm kids walked into town or even came by horse and wagon. Some kids rode horses to school. We didn't have buses then. But we, they brought guns to school. They brought rifles to school. Why? You had to check your rifle in the principal's office, of course. You didn't bring it into the classroom. But you brought rifles to school because on the way home you're going to do what? Hunt. hunt. You're going to hunt rabbits. You're going to hunt squirrel. And that's what you do on the way home. huh? And toward the end of the Depression, you were, that was food. That was food. But you knew how to use a gun and where to use a gun and all those kind of things, you see. So they weren't shooting up the school, you know. So you hear that. You hear that today. But what did the man say? What did that 80-year-old man say in that article? Well, he said, you know, no matter what controls you put, eventually, you're not going to stop it. Because the real problem is mental, spiritual, and that type of thing. Now, you don't hear. You don't ever in those, kind of those situations, you do not hear what else is behind all of that. What else has gone into that? Uh, and I haven't heard anything yet, either. Except that the boy was an orphan. That's the only thing I've heard so far. The boy was an orphan. young man was an orphan. And um, I would imagine there's all kinds of, you know, I can imagine there's lots of anger that can come out of that. Yeah. Well, the woman that raised him as a mother died four months earlier, which could have been a huge trigger, too. Yeah, yeah, could have been, yeah. Lots of reasons. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, finally what that is, is behind that is sin, isn't it? Behind that is sin. We hear of these things today, these terrorist things, but they're not new. They're not new. I was reading recently, and you know, we don't hear much back here in the Midwest here about the Indians during the time of the Revolutionary War and stuff like this. And we hear about what happened to Indians in the Middle West here. And my goodness, I was reading here recently, you know, how they wiped out whole villages of Indians in New England and how they deliberately infected blankets with smallpox and then gave them to the Indians in these villages so they would die of smallpox and wiped out whole villages in that kind of stuff. That terrorist things, that's part of history, you know. And I never read that before. Of the, I've never read about the Indians or history of Indians along the East Coast. You know, we heard about the Sioux and all of them out here. But that's a whole new area. I just can't imagine some of the awful things that happened back then. What's behind that again? What's right, what, what is right here? War and hatred and prejudice and all those kind of things. Well, what we're pointing to is just what sin does to us. What we We're talking about sin, its consequences here in this world, and they are manifold, mental, physical, all those kind of things that we've just mentioned. The ultimate consequence of sin, though, of course, is hell. And we want to look at that just for a few minutes and uh, look at 2 Thessalonians 1 7. 2 Thessalonians 1 7. Let me see, that is on page. Nine hundred and eighty-nine, nine hundred and eighty-nine, Second Thessalonians one seven. Do you have it? Nine eighty-nine, and to grant relief to, relief to you who afflict, and re, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. What that points out to us is that finally what hell is is eternal exclusion from the presence of God. That's what hell is. And it is a horrible, horrible picture. 
to be excluded from the presence of God. All of us live in the presence of God. Even if you're an atheist and you deny the existence of God, you still live in the presence of God because this world is his. You know, when the sun rises and shines, you are living in the presence of God because he is the one who makes that happen. And of course, you have food and you have clothing. So we live constantly in the presence of God. The air we breathe, everything is finally here because of his creating hand and his giving hand is what sustains us right now. So we live in the presence of God. But hell is simply being away from the presence of God. That we enter into eternity and we are not with God or blessed by God or in any way connected to God. It is exclusion from the presence of God. Now the Bible tries to picture that in all kinds of ways. It pictures it in terms of hell, I mean in terms of fire, because there is fire or being burned is one of the worst, uh, most painful things that can happen to us. It pictures it in terms of darkness. Hell is fire, hell is darkness, hell is a bottomless pit. There's all kinds of different pictures in scripture trying to bring out the reality of what existence would be outside the presence of God. Jesus described it in this way in, in a couple of these parables. He talks about being outside the banquet hall where it is dark and there is weeping, of na weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he uses that expression a couple of times or even more than that, where there is the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I've seen the weeping and gnashing of teeth once and can really relate to what Jesus is talking about because the weeping and gnashing of teeth is the ultimate consequence of guilt and it is not a pretty picture at all. One night some years ago I was up in my office about 10 o'clock at night and the phone rang and it was the motel out here, the one on the east side, uh, the west side of the road. And they were looking for a pastor who would come and talk to a person out there. And they had a person out there that was going to, who was uh, uh, going to commit suicide. And they discovered that because they, the, the owner went outside and here was some sheets tied together and they were laid over the banister on the second floor. And he rushed to this man and this man was going to commit suicide. And he talked him out of doing that right then and uh, said, if I get someone to talk to you, will you talk to them? And he said, yes. And he said, well, I'll try to get a pastor. And so they called here. They called several churches, and they were all closed. And so I went out there. And I got there, I don't know, between close to 11 o'clock, I guess. And he took me up to this room of this man. And here's this man, probably in his late 30s. And he was weeping profusely, you see. And he was in his T-shirt and his shorts and he was just sobbing and had been sobbing and reaping for I don't know how long. But his whole t-shirt was just wet with, uh, with uh, tears and he had a towel and he was twisting that towel as hard as he could and he was sobbing uncontrollably and at the same time gnashing his teeth. And he was doing like this. He was rubbing his teeth back and gnashing his teeth and weeping, sobbing, and twisting this towel as, as, as tight as he could. And we got him over on the, the bed, and I sat down beside him on the bed, put my arm around him, and talked to him for probably an hour, just very calmly and so on, trying to get him to stop crying. And eventually the story began to come out that he was a salesman. He left home on Monday mornings. He came home on Friday nights. And uh, during the week, of course, he's gone all week, around all over. And he has a wife and three children in Wichita. And uh, she's a fine Christian lady. He doesn't have anything to do with the church, but she's a fine Christian lady who goes to church and takes the children there. And he has committed adultery on her over and over again in all the various places where he stays in the motels. Uh, and he's done this for years. And it has got to the point now that he is so filled with guilt and he can't talk to the, about anybody about this. And he's so filled with guilt that he is ready to take his life. He's just being eaten up by guilt, you see. 
Well, we talked that night, and I, I don't know, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, I guess something like that when I left there. And he was calmed down, and, and I talked to him, you need to go to your wife's pastor, you need to go to your church, this, and so on and so forth, and get right with God, and talked to him about forgiveness and Christ dying for our sins and all of those kind of things and how we can start new life in him. And uh, that was it. I left then, and, and, uh, and uh, he thanked me for coming. Then about six months later, I suppose, I heard someone here on a Friday afternoon coming up the stairs, and here was the man again. And he simply came back to, to say thank you, to say thank you for coming out that night and being with me and helping me through that crisis. And he said that he had gone to his uh, church and gone to the pastor and, and straightened things out, and things were going well. And uh, he now knew what it was to know Jesus Christ and know the forgiveness of sins and all of those things. But the point I'm making is this, this is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Jesus uses that figure, you know, in, in all of my ministry. I've seen it once. That's the only time I've ever seen that. And yet Jesus uses that figure. So Jesus knew about that, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he says, that's what hell is. That's finally what hell is about. He uses that. It's experiencing one's guilt for eternity. And that's a horrible picture, to be in the dark and experience your guilt for eternity. Um, I don't know what else to say about it, but, that, but that is, that's what hell is. And uh, you'll hear people joke about hell, and, and, and um, they'll make, you know, it's going to be a great time there because all of my buddies will be there and we'll have a great, wonderful time and all that kind of stuff. You know, and people will kind of make fun of it and put it down and do not realize the horrible reality that Scripture pictures concerning that. But that's hell, and that's the ultimate consequence. And you see, God does not force himself upon, him, upon us. He cannot force himself upon us. All he can do is come to us and invite us to come to him and say, here's what I have to, to give to you, you see. You can't force, he can't force us to believe in him. He can't force us to trust in him. He can't force us to surrender our lives to him. In love, he has to let us be. And one of the sad pictures in scripture, of course, is this young man who comes to Jesus. Remember this? Where the rich young man comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus outlines these things and he says, I've done all of those things. What Jesus is trying to show him is that he's asking the wrong question. He shouldn't be asking, what must I do to be saved? He should be talking to Jesus about salvation itself, you see. And, and Jesus then says to him, and he's trying to show him his sin, and so he says, well, you need to go and sell everything you have and, and give it away because that has become your God. And then you have these poignant words. And he turned and walked away from Jesus. That was too big. And then these words, and Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. There was something about the young man that drew him, I mean that Jesus was drawn to him and says, and Jesus loved him. But Jesus has to let him walk away. He can't run after him and say, come back, come back. You don't know what you're missing. But finally, God in his love must give us the freedom even to say no to him, even though that no is going to mean this. He tells us what it's going to mean. But then man in his sin will not even believe God when he says, this is what it means. And he'll chance it himself. He'll chance it himself. Yeah. Remember C.S. Lewis. Do you know the name C.S. Lewis? You know, one of the greatest apologists of the last uh, century. C.S. Lewis talks about, I think it was his friend Tolkien, who said to him, because he was an atheist, Tolkien, his friend, was a devout Roman Catholic. And Tolkien said, you know, uh, C.S., have you ever thought of this? If you're wrong, what that means? If I'm wrong, you know, if I'm right, then what does that mean to you? If I'm wrong, and it is like you think it is, when you die, you're dead, I've lost nothing. I've lost nothing. But he says, if I happen to be right, and there is judgment, and there is heaven and hell, and you're wrong, my, what a terrible thing that is. And C.S. Lewis says, you know, that got him to thinking more. And he searched and he searched 
and finally came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, <clears throat> that's what hell is, and that's the consequence of sin. And that's what Christ experienced for us on Good Friday after, on Good Friday. He experienced for us the consequences of sin. He experienced existence outside of God. And that's what everything around that, around his death is symbolizing. You see, hell is, is a, the lack of the presence of God. Hell is, no pre, God is not present. And so think of what happened on Good Friday. Jesus is crucified on a cross. He hangs between heaven and hell. I mean heaven and earth. He has no place either in heaven or on earth. He is crucified without clothes, naked, because clothes are a gift of God. And then God blots out the sun because light is a gift of God. So he takes that away. And then his friends leave and there's no one there. So all the blessings of God are withdrawn from Christ. Christ experiences existence without God. Now how that can be, I don't know, because he's the son of God himself. But in the midst of that, he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What he's experiencing is our hell, the very things we've been talking about, you see. He has taken upon himself our guilt. When, it's, when we say he died for our sins, he has taken upon himself the guilt of our sins, the judgment against our sins. And the judgment, the ultimate question, the ultimate consequence of the judgment against our sins is the absence of God the absence of God, and Christ experiences that. And then cries out that, that uh, cry, and then dies. It is finished, and he dies. Well, all of that, of course, is what hell is. Hell was not designed for man in the beginning. It was designed for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. Matthew 25, 41. That is on page 831. 831. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, Prepared for the devil and his angels. There you see it. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. And it goes on. But this, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for man. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. But he, the devil, is under sentence. And he has said, and he has said, I'm not going to go alone. That's his intent. Okay. Okay. We'll try it. Anyway, but he says, I'm not going down alone. And when you hear, you hear that, you think of history and of Adolf Hitler. In 1943, and the story is told that Adolf Hitler in 1943, his, his generals come to him and they say, there is, there's no way that uh, we can win this war. The Allies now <clears throat> are going to win this war. And if we keep fighting, all of Germany is going to go down. And Hitler's response to that was, if I'm going down, I'll take Germany with me. And of course, that's what happened, wasn't it? And now when you read in the history books, you know, that's called satanic thinking. And we say that was satanic thinking because he said, Satan says, I'm going down, but I'm not going alone. I'm going to take everyone I can. And that's what Hitler also said. Well, from all of this now, looking at all of this, I hope that what I've been able to bring across is this that our situation is desperate in sin and, our, and we are helpless to do anything about it. And that's where God comes into the picture because he knows that and he wants us to realize that. 
And that's why in the very first lesson I talked about law and gospel. God comes to us first with the law. He has to point out our sin. He has to point us to our situation so that we become ready to receive that which he wants to give to us to right that situation. In other words, we talked about law and gospel. There's the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ is Savior. But to appreciate that good news and receive that good news and believe that good news, we've got to see how desperately we need it. And that's what the law does. The law shows me my sin, and at that point, I am ready to receive what God has to give to me. In between there is repentance, is repentance. And repentance is simply this. I wake up to what sin really is. I wake up to what it is in my life. I wake up to my own need, and I turn to the Lord for what he wants to give to me. When Jesus, when John the Baptist first began preaching, and then Jesus followed in the same way, and you read this in the New Testament, Jesus came preaching, repent and believe. Repent and believe. See how those two go together? You will not, what Jesus brought was the good news, and what John the Baptist brought was the good news. But the good news will mean nothing unless you repent first. And so that's why that language that way. Repent and believe. Because in repentance, I see my need. In repentance, I see my, I see my sin. In repentance, and I turn from that to receive what God wants to give me. Repentance then, is simply turning. That's what the word means, turning, isn't it? So here I am going in the wrong direction, and God intersects that with his law, and through his law he shows me my sin, and through his law he calls me, and through the gospel then he tells me about my Lord Jesus Christ, and he turns me around to come to my Lord Jesus Christ to receive what he has done on the cross for me and my salvation. There is repentance, that turning, and along with that repentance, of course, comes confession. And my confession is simply this, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. And if you look in your Bible then on page, or on 1 John, let me see where it is. 1 John 1.8, 1 John 1.8, would you look at that? Let me see what page that's on. 1 John 1.8 is on page 1020, 21, 1021, 1021. This is where it begins, our turning back to the Lord to receive that which he wants to give to us. But look what it says, John 1, 8, 1 John 1, 8, 1021. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Think of those who will not confess their sin or see their sin or acknowledge their sin. And the Bible says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Because God says you have. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Faithful and just. To forgive our sins. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so... I see my sin through the law as God presents that to me. He shows me my sin and I'm brought to the point of confession and I say, yes, that's true. That's me and I see it. And I know it is, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. There's absolutely nothing I can do about it. I'm ready to receive, Lord, that which you have done for me that I might um, have the forgiveness of my sins. And God is presented and has put into this world what is called the office of the keys. And the office of the keys is that part of the church in which we preach the gospel and learn about the forgiveness of sins. That little booklet that I gave you, the little catechism I gave you, you got that? Now you don't have this one, but you got it, okay? Okay. 
Look to, the, look to that part which talks about the office of the keys. In, this, in my little booklet, it's on page 18. I need to get that little booklet that you've got so that I'll have the right pages. What page is it on in your, in your catechism, in your little booklet? Do you have it? My page is 18. What's your page? We're looking for, it's where it says confession. 18, same page, okay, 18. So look on page 18. Now, this is talking about confession. And see what it says? We're talking about this now. Coming back to the Lord in repentance and confessing our sins. Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. And what sins should we confess before God? We should plead guilty of all our sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. And then which are these? Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done anything? What this is talking about is what is called the office of the keys. And there's two kinds of confession. There is general confession in the scriptures, and there is private confession. Private confession is simply when you go, let's say, to the pastor, something is really, really bothering you, and you can tell it to God and you cannot feel any, or you cannot get a sense of forgiveness. And it just keeps plaguing you and the devil keeps after you and he keeps accusing you and putting you down. Private confession, of course, is a very voluntary thing. There's nothing, uh, you don't have to do that, you never have to do that. It is well and good that you can go to the Lord himself and confess your sins and, and, and hear his word of forgiveness and be uh, cleansed in that way and, and, and feel his peace in that way. But also, in our church services, and you know this, every Sunday, we have what is called general confession. At the very beginning of the service, we confess our sins. On communion Sundays, you've heard these words over and over, perhaps, where we confess this. We say, by nature, we are sinful and unclean, and we have sinned against God by thought, word, and deed. And the first thing we do as we come into the worship service is we confess our original sin, and our actual sin. I am by nature sinful and unclean. See, that's original sin. And I have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. That's my actual sin. That's the sin of doing, the sin of disease and the sin of doing. And I confess both of those things to the Lord, and I then ask that of his mercy, he would grant to me the forgiveness of my sins, because Christ Jesus died on the cross to take away my sin. And then the pastor turns around, and the pastor says, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce unto you the grace of God. And in the stead, and listen to the words, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now sometimes people hear that and they get disturbed by that because they hear only these words. The pastor says, I forgive you your sins. But before that he has said, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce unto you the grace of God, and I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So where does the pastor get the authority to do that? He gets that authority from Matthew, from John chapter 20, verse 19. Would you look at that, John chapter 20, verse 19? The pastor is not forgiving anyone's sins. He is simply speaking for the Lord, and in response to your confession, he is saying, the Lord forgives you, and I am his voice to announce that to you. Matthew 20, 19. Do you see it? Jesus appears to the disciples. This is after the resurrection. And he appears to the disciples. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, uh, and Je Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even, I, even so I am sending you. 
And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And if you look at Matthew and what is said there, he says the same thing. There on Matthew 18, though, before, he, before the resurrection, he tells them this before his death and before his resurrection, and then he says this to them afterwards, too, you see. That what he's doing is saying this, I want my people to know that I forgive them, and I want you to announce that to them in response to their repentance. And so when the pastor says, I forgive your sins, he's simply saying the same thing that Jesus said to that paralytic. And remember the paralytic they brought to him? And Jesus said to the, to the young man, young man, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven, for I forgive you your sins. So the pastor announces that. Now, when you are repentant of your sins and you believe what the pastor said, that simply is an assurance. That is an assurance. Now think of this. The devil is so intense in, in filling us with guilt and in robbing us of the peace that comes with, with Christ's forgiveness that our Lord gives to us the Lord's gives to us the Lord's Supper, and in the Lord's Supper we are hearing the same thing over and over and over again. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And our Lord gives us that so that we'll be sure, and Satan cannot accuse us and put us down and cannot tear us up with guilt because he is so good at doing that. And so here's our Lord who gives us for the Lord's Supper, the sacrament in which we hear constantly about his forgiveness and that he died for us and all those things. And we hear it at the beginning of the service. We end at the beginning of the service. And then at the end of the service, we hear the benediction. And in the benediction, we are sent away with peace. And the Lord bless you and keep you and so on and so forth and give you peace. So we begin with forgiveness and the assurance of forgiveness. And we end to go out into the world again, forgiven and at peace. See, that's all what the liturgy is about. Yes. How do you relate to that last half of that second part um, where he says, receive the Holy Spirit, if you forgive the sins of many, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from many, it is withheld. Yes. How, how are we to... That's what self-exclusion is, and that's what excommunication is. Now, that's talking to the church. That's talking to the church. And it is saying to the church, if there are those in the church and those who claim to, to believe in Jesus Christ, but they are living in sin and they will not repent of that sin or change from that sin, then you must tell them you're not forgiven. That you cannot play with the grace of God. That you cannot say to the Lord, please forgive me of this, and then continue doing it, you see, and continue in that way. Or that self-exclusion. Here's a person who has become a part of the church, but then no longer comes at all. And when they're not coming at all anymore, they're saying, I don't need to hear forgiveness. I don't need to receive forgiveness. I don't need to know the Lord. I can get along quite well in life without him and his word of forgiveness. And so they're excluding themselves from the very forgiveness that the Lord wants to assure them of. And that's that too. In other words, don't let a person believe that they're living in forgiveness if they are not. Because what that means if they're living and not living in forgiveness, that they are condemned, that they are judged, and they are living under judgment. So it's a matter of life and death. If a person is living death, then you have to tell him he's living death. He's living without forgiveness. So can Christians fool themselves and think they're forgiven? Sure. Sure. If you're not, if you're not looking to Christ, or if you're not living in Christ, walking with Christ. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, on the last day there will be all kinds of people who say, Lord, Lord. And he says, I don't know you. And they say, but we know you. We know you. What they're saying, of course, is we were acquainted with we, you, you, you knew, we knew about you, but we didn't know you. We weren't walking with you or living with you or trusting in you or being obedient to you. So where there is faith, there is going to be a life of faith that you can't, you can't have the blessings of faith 
and then not live the life of faith. See? The Apostle Paul talks about that too, doesn't he? He talks about the gospel and how in Christ Jesus we are forgiven. And then he asks this question, does that mean that being forgiven in Christ, I can go out and do anything I want to do and live in any kind of sin I want to? And Paul says what? God forbid. Let's try, let's take an advantage of God's goodness and grace. And that simply cannot be. God will not be manipulated and he will not be taken advantage of. See, he is our father, but he will not be manipulated or taken advantage of. You cannot uh, take advantage of his grace. See, that finally, when I do have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I do realize how he has rescued me and what a great thing he has done for me, that's going to change my life. That's going to change my life. I'll talk about that next week in the sermon too, where God makes a covenant with Abraham and then says the result of that I'm making my covenant with me is that you will walk before me. You'll walk before me. You won't walk away from me, but you'll walk before me, which means this. God is saying, now you're going to live your whole life in my presence. And that does mean accountability. So while God gives me these gifts, he also, at the same time, requires a life that goes along with those gifts. It's not the gifts, I mean, it's not the life lived that, that uh, brings me salvation. It is the gift of salvation. But evidence of the gift is seen in my life, in my life. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions along with that question that was just asked? That's a good question because there are lots of churches that... Um, do not uh, uh, discipline, or, you know, you can belong there and um, live any kind of way I guess you want to, whether you come to church or not come to church and that kind of thing, you see. The reason we record attendance here, you know, if you come to church here, you, you, you sign in. We keep attendance and we have to do that because of the number of people that we have. There's 1,200 people here. And, uh, but we pay very close attention to that, you see. And, um, and the communion attendance, because your worship attendance, your communion attendance says something about your relationship to the Lord. And we're going to be contacting you, we're going to be sending you mail, we're going to be visiting you and all kinds of things. If we begin to see you drifting away, we're going to do everything we can to bring you back because we know that you can drift away from the Lord. There are churches that teach you cannot drift away from the Lord, you cannot lose your salvation, but that is not biblical. My goodness, all of the Biblia, you know, everything talks about how we are to watch out for one another. And when a sheep gets lost, we are to go and find that sheep and bring that sheep back. And we are to love one another and be concerned about one another and do all those kind of things. We are to look after each other's spiritual salvation. And that's what the church is all about. And we'll talk about that too when we get to chapter or lesson 11. Because uh, if we do not, the devil is out there to pull us away from and pull us down and so that's why we have to be so very concerned about that but um, excommunication yes um, ex self-exclusion that's more so that's more so than excommunication I've I've never been a part of an excommunication and the excommunication is this where the person is living in open sin and defies everything that's according to the scriptures and so on and will not repent, but still wants to belong to the church. And finally, the church has to say to him, no, your life is such that, that uh, you cannot. Excommunication is saying to the person, you can't come to Holy Communion because Holy Communion is about the receiving of forgiveness. And you cannot come to Holy Communion and then say you don't need forgiveness because that's what that's about. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've come to the end of this lesson now. And, um, but, um, um, let's see, the questions, we can run through these questions real quickly. Question, lesson number four, there's a couple of passages which, uh, oh, I didn't get to. Anyway, Jesus called the devil a murderer and a liar. I said this last week, Martin Luther said you can't keep the birds from flying around your head, but you can keep them from building what? A nest in your hair. In other words, you can't keep the devil away from tempting you, but you can say no to him. The devil never quits 
always he is tempting. And there you can write in different things that we had on the board, like the youth or middle age or old age. But sin with big letters is what? A disease of our being. And sin with small, small letters is a disease of our doing. The two kinds of actual sin are? I wrote them on the board here. Commission and omission. Commission and omission. Hell is eternal exclusion from the presence of God. Hell is the end of a Christless life. It is also to go out into eternity without No, hell is the end of a Christless life where you reject Jesus Christ. Hell is the end of a Christless life. If you live a Christless life, you're going to end up in hell. Right. Yeah. It is to go out into eternity without God. That's a terrible picture. It is God's will that all be saved, yes. Ezekiel 18.32, I didn't have you look that up. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. And I forget what else goes on. You can look that up. Ezekiel 18.38. First Timothy 2.4 says, it's talking about God who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God does the work of saving through the law and gospel. The law shows us our sin and leads us to repentance. The gospel shows us our Savior and leads us to faith. Repentance is turning from sin back to the Lord. The Bible says God brings about repentance through his law and gospel. The first step back to God is confession. There are two types of confession, private and general. The authority that God has given his church to preach the gospel, forgive sins and retain sins is called the office of the keys. Yes. Now, next week we will see the movie Martin Luther. And the reason we see the movie Martin Luther at this particular point is that the whole Reformation was about the forgiveness of sins. The Roman Catholic Church was saying, you have to earn your forgiveness. If you have to earn it in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way. And Luther, as he began to see the scriptures and study the scriptures, realized that that was not so and that the church was taking advantage of people in all kinds of ways, making them have, having to earn forgiveness. And so the whole Reformation began with this idea, how is a person forgiven of their sins? That was the beginning of the Reformation. And that's what we're going to look at next week. And I encourage you, to be here, you know, and to be here right on time because we, we'll, it, it starts at six o'clock, and I mean at four o'clock, and we'll get out about four minutes after six. So it's that long a movie. So I encourage you to be here right on time and be here about five minutes ahead because we give you a little brochure that talks about Luther, and uh, then you'll see the film. And I used to say, even if you break your leg on the way here, come and see the movie, and then go to the hospital and get your leg set. But that's how urgent it is. I used to say that. Until we had a man who came to see the movie. And when he came to see the movie, he had a pain in his side. And he sat all the way through the movie, hurting in his side. Didn't say a word to anybody. But as soon as he got through the movie, he went out to the emergency ward. Emergency ward and they found out he had appendicitis. And they operated on his appendix 
that evening, right? So we sat through that whole movie, hurting with appendicitis. So since then, I have not stressed that you should come, even though you got a broken leg. One other thing, is it turned off now? Okay, anyway, I want to just, well, I can, you, you can leave it on. Um, someone has asked about Lent, what is Lent? Lent, of course, that word comes from an Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon word, lengthen, which is from which we get our word lengthen. And uh, Lent comes in the spring when the days are lengthening. And uh, the word Lent itself means spring, spring. Now, it goes way back to the very beginning. And the first Lent was simply 40 hours long. And the church set aside the 40 hours between the moment that Christ died, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and Sunday morning. And they set aside those 40 hours to fast and to think about and to hear about Christ's life and death. And then about the year, now just think of this, in the year around 300, all the way back then, in the year 300, they began to, they, uh, began to set aside 36 days, 36 days for Lent. And they said, we're going to give back to the Lord 10% of a year, 36 days, 10% of a year in which we just focus on the life and death of Christ and everything that he did for us. And then in the year 730, 730, this is a time of Charlemagne. And they add four days to Lent. And they say, no, it'll be 40 days long. And that's the amount of time that Jesus spent in the desert praying and and fasting and talking to his father and so on. And that's the amount of time that Moses spent in the desert and Elijah spent in the desert in repentance and fasting and prayer. And so we're going to make this a period of Lent 40 days. The 40 days are the, we day we, the, the weekdays, not Sundays. Sundays are not part of Lent. And so uh, uh, the weekdays are part of Lent. So we have special Lenten services, and sometimes there are people who fast during Lent and so on. There's all kinds of traditions connected with Lent. I think one of the neatest ones is that it was during Lent that they came up with pretzels. And you know the story of pretzels, you see. Pretzels are made of uh, flour and salt and water and so on and so forth, and then shaped in like a pretzel. But why are they shaped like a pretzel? Because during the Middle Ages, one of the ways of praying, one of the, one of the stances of praying was to put your arms like this. Those who you prayed with your arms like this, with your hands on your shoulders and your arms like that. What's that remind you of? Pretzel. That's a pretzel, huh? And so they made pretzels during Lent. And you ate pretzels, pretzels during Lent. You couldn't eat meat, you couldn't eat dairy products, and you couldn't eat eggs, but you could eat pretzels. And every time you ate a pretzel, you were, you were reminded you should be using this period of 40 days for prayer and repentance. Anyway, that's where Lent comes from. And it's a, it goes way back, but just think of that. Been celebrating uh, Lent for uh, way back to the early church, early church, you see. Now, sad to say, and you'll hear this as we go through this, you're gonna hear this several times. Lots of things in um, other Protestant churches, uh, there's lots of things that they did not take from the Catholic church. He said, that's Catholic and therefore we're not going to do that. We Lutherans didn't do that. We said we're going to keep the best of the Catholic Church, and when other Protestants come along, we'll steal what's good from them, and we're just going to get as much as we can from everybody. So I often kid about that. You know, when you come to a Lutheran church, there's going to be lots of Catholic, and there's going to be a lot of other Protestants, because we just will take the best of everybody and use it here. Okay? Let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.